Justin Gaines was born on March 30, 1989. At the age of 18, Justin had moved from his hometown of Snellville, Georgia, and was a freshman at Gainesville State College, now called the University of North Georgia. On the night of November 1, 2007, his friends dropped him off at the now-closed Wild Bill's Dance Club in Duluth, Georgia. Justin was a regular customer at Wild Bill's and had a VIP ticket that allowed him to get in free, but his friends were left to pay a cover charge. However, not wanting to pay, his friends decided to skip the dance club and instead just dropped Justin off. Justin was very social and comfortable making friends and having a good time alone. Surveillance video shows he arrived at exactly 11.38 p.m., and eyewitnesses last saw Justin around 1 a.m. at the bar. He would then call his roommate around 2 a.m. asking for a ride. However, his roommate was unable to pick him up. According to a parking lot attendant, Justin found a ride and left the bar sometime between 2 and 2.30 a.m. This would be the last time Justin was ever seen again. The minimum age to enter the club was 18, and the minimum drinking age was 21, so Justin had two fake IDs, one in the name of Brad Allen and the other Brad Shue. Wild Bills was an enormous venue, and it's estimated that there were about 3,000 people there on this particular night. He could be seen on surveillance cameras chatting with various people, and it didn't appear that he got into any arguments or confrontations with anyone. Around 1.30 a.m., Justin could be seen on surveillance footage in the lobby on his cell phone. Since he hadn't planned a ride home in advance, he was having to call around looking for a ride home. Surveillance cameras continued to show him wandering in and out of the club between 1.30 and 2 a.m. Justin was close to his family and was normally good about checking in with them, so by Sunday, Justin's mom, Erica Wilson, had become very worried. So she got in touch with his friends and tried local medical facilities but could not find any trace of Justin. With his car, wallet, and laptop all still at his parents' home, and no signs of Justin, Erica called the police and reported him missing. Police immediately got his cell phone records to see if they could track him, but the last time his phone was used was in the area of Wild Bills. They could see that he made several phone calls and sent text messages between 1.30 a.m. and 2 a.m., clearly trying to get a ride, but there was no activity after that. Investigators were trying to get help from some of Justin's friends and non-associates, but because alcohol was a factor in this case, many of them were afraid they would get in trouble because they were all underage. Volunteers with Texas EquiSearch searched extensively for three days, but were unable to find Justin. Even after EquiSearch left, Justin's friends and family continued searching. They even hired a private investigator and started a nonprofit organization to pay for billboards, flyers, and other items necessary for the search. Every Thursday night, they would drive to Wild Bills and put leaflets about the case on each car in the parking lot, hoping at some point they would reach someone who had seen what happened to Justin. Three months after Justin was last seen, investigators acknowledged for the first time that they were working on a lead in the case and it seemed to indicate that foul play was involved. But, of course, Justin's family had already suspected this, and Justin's stepfather, Steve, said his theory was that Justin got a ride with someone he shouldn't have, and it didn't end well. Justin's mom, Erica, converted her garage into office space and made it her full-time job to look for her son. She organized fundraisers, made buttons and bumper stickers, raised reward money, handed out flyers, set up a telephone tip line, and maintained a website. Like her husband, Erica believed that Justin had probably been killed by someone who offered him a ride. By summer of 2009, the case had been turned over to a cold case detective. At this point, leads were coming in more sporadically, and nothing led investigators to an arrest. Justin's family had already been through so much, and then on January 17, 2011, they suffered another devastating loss. Jeremy Wilson, one of Justin's stepbrothers, was just 18 years old when he was found dead from asphyxiation at home. He was found with a plastic bag over his head, 
but they couldn't determine if it had been an accident or if Jeremy had taken his own life. Suddenly, in the fall of 2015, they had a break in the case. The lead investigator on the case theorized that Justin got a ride from a blonde-haired woman at Wild Bill's and that the woman took him to a house in Snellville. That's where he was robbed and killed and his body was dumped in Lake Lanier before being moved to a well in Barrow County or Walton County. 57-year-old Martin Leonard Wilkie was arrested and charged with concealing Justin's body. The arrest warrant alleged that Wilkie and a man named Dustin Dillon Glass had assaulted Justin in an encounter that ultimately led to him being shot to death. It further alleged that Wilkie and an unnamed third man disposed of the body in a black metal toolbox after Justin died. All this information came from one of the suspects, Dustin Glass, who was in jail on an unrelated matter. The female that was present during the assault corroborated Glass's story. Glass's mother, Thelma Ballou, who has a criminal record, also backed up his story, but then lied to police about knowing where Justin's body had been left. She told police that she had helped Wilkie and another man dispose of Justin's body in the High Shoals area near the Appalachie River. Taking her at her word, investigators spent three days digging up several old whales at the location pinpointed by her, but found absolutely nothing. When it became clear they weren't going to find Justin where she said they would, Thelma was charged with making false statements to law enforcement officials. She admitted she lied in an attempt to get herself out of trouble. Investigators aren't putting much faith in what Glass has said because the 28-year-old was ordered to serve 14 years in a federal prison for repeat drug offenses. He had also been indicted in a different case where he was charged with conspiracy to commit murder, racketeering, aggravated assault, and participating in gang activity. So it wasn't until he was facing more time in prison that he came forward with the information about Justin. Glass said he assaulted Justin and took his diamond earring but didn't kill him. Despite the information given to law enforcement by Glass and Thelma, there has never been enough evidence to charge anyone with the murder. Detectives believe they know what happened to Justin, but cannot prove any of it. Investigators believe Justin's diamond ring and cash attracted the attention of the wrong person inside Wild Bill's. They had identified him as their target hours before he attempted to leave the bar and probably followed him into the lobby area. The fact that he didn't have a ride home made things very easy for them. Investigators believe that Justin was lured into a car once he was outside the bar, most likely by a blonde female wearing a black dress. They then drove him to a house in Snellville crowded with people, meaning there could be multiple witnesses. Detectives believe that Justin was attacked as soon as he arrived at the house. Supposedly, he was choked and beaten and then finally shot to death. They then took the money he was carrying and his diamond ring. Then his body was taken to a houseboat on Lake Lanier and thrown into the lake. A couple of days later, the murderers panicked when they realized that his body had floated to the surface, so they retrieved it from the lake and threw it down a well near the Appalachie River. It's important to remember that most, if not all, of the details in this account came from Glass and only after he was already in jail on many charges. While detectives seem to believe he was being honest with them, there is no definitive physical evidence to back him up. However, they have a few things that corroborate his story. The first being a diamond ring found in his possession. In a photograph taken on the morning that Justin went missing, He can be seen wearing a diamond earring that does look like the one that Justin had. He told police that he had taken it out of Justin's ear the night he was killed, but continues to claim he had nothing to do with the actual killing. Police sent the diamond earring he had to the crime lab for analysis, but they could not find any DNA linking it to Justin. Investigators have searched multiple sites in both Barrow County and Walton County, but have never found any signs of Justin. The houseboat he was supposedly taken to no longer exists, and neither does the van Glass claims Justin's body was transported in. 
Detectives continue to search for Justin's remains, and his loved ones are hopeful that someone who knows what happened will finally come forward with the information needed to close the case. But as of January 2023, this case remains unsolved. Catherine Janice was born on September 4, 1980, and went by Katie. She lived in Detroit until about 2006, before moving to Atlanta, Georgia. Katie loved to read and collect books and had taught herself to play the guitar, and she enjoyed writing and singing songs. After moving to Atlanta, she took on a job as a bar manager for the Whole World Improv Theater in Atlanta's Midtown and worked there for nearly a decade. After that, Katie began working as a bartender at the Campagnolo Restaurant and Bar, a job that would cause her to keep some odd hours. Meanwhile, she lived in Atlanta with her partner, Emma Clark, and their three pets, Tori, Fig, and Bowie. Katie often went for walks in or around Piedmont Park late at night while listening to music or podcast with her earbuds. Although Emma had suggested she carry pepper spray, Katie insisted she felt safe. On the night of July 27, 2021, around 11.30 p.m., Katie left with her pit bull Bowie for a walk. Emma was working at Henry's Midtown Tavern on 10th Street and said Katie had come by to get a bite to eat. While there, Emma said she would be getting off work in an hour, so they made plans for Katie to return so they could all walk home together. After saying goodbye, Katie and Bowie decided to continue their walk through Piedmont Park. The park is very large, consisting of 189 acres, and a handful of movies had scenes filmed there. A camera near 10th and Piedmont captured Katie and Bowie as they walked across the Rainbow Crosswalk at 12.09 a.m. Unfortunately, Katie would never meet back up with Emma and was never seen alive again. When Emma arrived home after midnight, she was worried that Katie wasn't home and never met her back at work as they had planned and wasn't answering her calls or text. So Emma tracked her phone through the Find My iPhone app and noticed her location wasn't moving. At this point, Emma thought Katie might have dropped her phone, so she decided to ride her bike to that location. Emma soon made a shocking discovery around 1 a.m. As she passed the entrance gate on Charles and Piedmont, she noticed what looked like a trash bag lying on the ground just beyond the gates. This, however, would prove to be her three-year-old pit bull, Bowie. She got closer and realized he was dead. Then she found Katie's deceased body lying about a hundred feet away. Katie and Bowie had both been stabbed to death in what you would call an overkill. The autopsy report also noted the letters F-A-T had been carved into her chest. They also found DNA in Bowie's hair as he likely bit their attacker. The FBI quickly joined the case, and the police released a photo of a jogger they were hoping to speak with and said that person had come forward and was talking with detectives. They did not provide a further update, but hoped the jogger may have witnessed something that night. The motive didn't appear to be a robbery, as her expensive headphones were not taken, nor her cash or cell phone. Later, police officials would hint at the killer remaining at the scene, with evidence surfacing that he did not leave the park immediately after killing Katie and Bowie. A rumor posted by anonymous sources in Atlanta's law enforcement community seems to center around the killer dragging Katie's body to where it was found. If so, they may have killed or incapacitated Katie in another part of the park and dragged her to a darker, more isolated location. A massive search of the area would ensue days after the murder, with officers scouring through the park, looking for any potential clues. In addition, the small lake inside the park would be searched by dive teams for clues. Perhaps a murder weapon or evidence that the killer might have tried to clean themselves up after the stabbings. One of the things that attracted a lot of attention early on was the murder of another young woman in a park nearby. On the same evening as Katie's death, an 18-year-old named Tori Lang was shot and killed at the Yellow River Park in Stone Mountain, Georgia, about 17 miles from Piedmont Park. The two murders, 
which were extremely different but brutal in their own way, were linked by many online because of their timing and proximity, leading to a lot of discussion about a potential serial killer operating in Atlanta's parks. Afterward, Atlanta Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms informed the public that there was no evidence to suggest that the murder was a hate crime or that a serial killer was on the loose near Piedmont Park. Police would also conduct multiple searches throughout the neighborhoods around Piedmont Park, looking for any clues or surveillance footage. In the following weeks, the city installed new cameras at Piedmont Park after it came out that the multiple cameras inside the park were outdated and many not functional. Sadly, due to the pandemic at the time, Katie and her mother hadn't seen each other since Christmas 2019. In fact, Katie had made plans to see her mother soon in Detroit, Michigan, and was in the middle of shopping for her upcoming visit when she was given the devastating news. As of January 2023, no arrests have been made, and this case remains unsolved. Athena Joy Curry was born the youngest of five siblings on November 2, 1990. Athena was athletic and loved to write poetry. She also attended Grant High School, where she played softball and ran track. In 2008, she moved to Atlanta, Georgia, with her older sister Aisha to finish her senior year, so that she would be eligible for in-state tuition. At the age of 20, she was a mother to a young son named King Care, whom she adored and was fathered by her boyfriend, Yusef Mujahid. The couple had a tumultuous relationship, and on at least one occasion, Yusef was arrested in Gwinnett County in 2010 after he hit Athena and threatened her with a taser the same day she and her newborn left the hospital after giving birth. The couple was on and off for several years, and Athena's family was surprised when she said the couple was planning on looking at homes and moving in together as a family. Athena dreamed of becoming a pediatrician and was enrolled at the University of Phoenix, but she never got the chance to achieve her goal. In 2011, Athena had plans to spend Memorial Day weekend with Yusef and her son at Yusef's home on Beecher Street in Atlanta, Georgia. Athena and King used public transportation to make the 45-minute trip from Duluth, Georgia. With the plan still in place to move in together, they were going to use the holiday weekend to look at rental properties. However, during the early morning hours of Friday, May 27, 2011, Athena and Yusuf got into an argument after Athena found text messages from another woman on his phone. Athena's mother told Aisha that she had a bad feeling about Athena, and so Aisha called to see if she was okay. Aisha would say that when she spoke to Athena, she sounded like she had been sleeping, but other than that, she said she was fine. Aisha had no way of knowing that would be the last time she would ever speak with her sister. While Yusef told police it was a minor argument, he was known to be allegedly violent. Yusef claims that a few hours later, at 3 a.m., Athena stormed out of his home to cool off after their argument, wearing only a tank top and shorts. She didn't take her 16-month-old son or any other belongings. It would be four days before Yusef informed Athena's family of her disappearance. When Monday rolled around and Athena was nowhere to be found, Aisha tried to call her sister again, but this time Athena's phone was off. Interestingly, Yusef nor Athena owned a vehicle, so if she left, it would have been on foot. And if Yusef had been involved in her disappearance, he would have needed help or would have needed to borrow a vehicle. But the investigator would say there was no evidence of foul play at his house. On Tuesday, Aisha received a strange call from Yusef, wanting to know when Athena was coming to pick up the baby. He claims he and Athena got into a fight over text messages that Athena found on his phone from another woman. However, Yusef stuck to his story that Athena stormed out on foot at about 3 a.m. and never returned. Aisha said she immediately called the police, and neighborhood searches were conducted. After the police got involved, Yusef would downplay their argument as being minor, but those who knew him would allege that he was known to get violent during arguments. Athena's loved ones stated that they knew she would never leave her son behind, no matter the circumstances. They said her son was her pride and joy, 
and they said she would have called someone to help her once she could leave. This was not the first violent incident to be reported. Just two days before her disappearance, she was outside screaming and hollering for the neighbors to call the police, and Yusef was allegedly beating her on the ground. However, Yusef tried to blame Athena for the violence, saying she had once attacked him with scissors and allegedly injured him. To this day, Yusef denies having anything to do with Athena's disappearance, and also helped search for her in the days and weeks following her disappearance. A couple of years after Athena disappeared, Aisha would adopt Athena's son, King. Crime Watch Daily tried to talk to Yusef multiple times about Athena's disappearance. The first time they went to Atlanta, he was in jail after three separate incidents involving two other girlfriends. He has since been charged with multiple felony counts, including aggravated assault and strangulation. He has pleaded not guilty to those charges and was recently released on bond. Athena's family has never given up hope and continues to search for answers. However, as of January 2023, Athena has never been found and this case remains unsolved. Heather Nicole Turner was born in Dallas, Georgia on June 20, 1981. At the age of 35, Heather was married to a former associate pastor named Andy Turner and working at the local probate office as a deputy clerk in Paulding County, Georgia. She was described as full of personality with a great sense of humor and was said to be an all-around amazing woman. Heather's son from a previous relationship arrived back to his father's care with bruises and was taken to the hospital. Andy admitted to being rough with the baby and the judge ordered Andy to no longer be around the child. While Heather's ex-husband would keep her son safe, she had a daughter to protect that she shared with Andy. Andy was allegedly abusive toward Heather as well and she had told family and friends she was planning to leave him. In fact, she sat with the local probate judge while Heather told the judge she was leaving Andy the very next day. The judge encouraged her to get a restraining order, but Heather said that would make matters worse. The next day, May 4, 2017, at 6 a.m., Andy called 911 and told the dispatcher that as soon as his wife finished her morning shower, she shot herself in the bathroom while still wet and nude. Andy said that he was in the bedroom when he heard the gunshot. He can then be heard on the 911 call telling the dispatcher that he was getting Heather out of the shower, turning the water off, and then allegedly attempting CPR. For some reason, Andy strangely contacted his parents, who lived 10 or 15 minutes away, before he ever called 911. He initially claimed to have discovered his wife at 5.30 a.m., but didn't call 911 until 6 a.m., and the incident time on the officer's report would read 5.30 a.m. as well. His father even got on the phone with the dispatcher, and when asked if she was past being saved, he said yes. The scene was not investigated, and her body was quickly removed from the home so the school bus could navigate through the emergency vehicles. The angle of the wound was back behind her right ear, angled down, and was not in the typical area of self-infliction. There were also no contact burns from the gun. Law enforcement's standard procedure for gunshot deaths is to treat them all initially as a homicide, rope off the scene, have people interviewed, and have names logged until it is later determined to be self-inflicted. In addition, Andy's hands were allegedly never tested for gunshot residue. Heather was quickly cremated, and her death certificate does not state self-inflicted or homicide and instead reads undetermined. The coroner's report states that Heather was found on her back on the bathroom floor and that the wall near the toilet appeared to have been washed. At the time of the incident, the couple's eight-year-old daughter was on the couch in the next room. Heather's loved ones said not only would Heather not do this to herself, but she definitely wouldn't have done it with her daughter in the next room. A note was discovered that read, I'm sorry, I love you, but her family says Heather often wrote little notes like that. That note was allegedly passed off as being recent, 
but her family says it was most likely written sometime in the past. 30 days before her death, Andy allegedly showed up to Heather's job at the probate office, angry and drinking, and was removed by a deputy. Andy allegedly said he would see Heather buried before he would allow her to leave him. Although her husband said she took her own life, the Georgia Bureau of Investigation have called her death questionable. Her friends and family continue to shed light on Heather's story with hopes of seeing this case resolved so they can begin their healing process. Heather's longtime friend, Johnny Miller, and her husband, Jeremy Miller, who starred in the 1980s hit show Growing Pains, said they know Heather didn't take her own life and continue to seek justice. There are also people who believe that in the 911 call, you can hear him in the background saying, Mama, I killed her. I'm going to play the audio so y'all can let me know what you think. Mama. At, least, at least two inches, okay? Take a deep breath for me, Andy. Oh my God. Andy, Andy, take a, take a deep breath, okay? You still want to keep doing compressions. Andy is now being accused of physical abuse and indecent assault by his former nanny and girlfriend, 27-year-old Christy Chupp. Christy says that she and Andy began dating several weeks after Heather's death. At the same time, she began working for Andy as a nanny to his children. Soon into their relationship, though, is when the alleged abuse started. Painfully bending her fingers back, hair pulling, and twisting her arm are just some of the abuse Christy says she received from Andy. She said she also received death threats and a black eye after he hit her. During one intimate encounter, she alleges that he ordered her to lie on her stomach and told her to hold Heather's ashes so he could simultaneously be with both of them. She has now been granted a restraining order against him following the accusations. Andy told Channel 2 he couldn't talk with them because he's under contract for a book and a movie about the case. He has also allegedly refused over the past five years to be formally interviewed by the sheriff's office. Authorities state that Andy is not a suspect, but he hasn't been ruled out either. Andy continues to deny the allegations, and as of January 2023, this case remains unsolved. Blake Tyler Chapel was born on February 7, 1994, and lived in Georgia. At the age of 17, Blake was described as a very friendly individual who never met a stranger. He also loved being the center of attention and was someone that everyone loved to be around. He had an infectious laugh, was easygoing, and was always willing to help the people he cared about. Blake loved riding his dirt bike on the trails near his home and loved skateboarding, drawing, and playing Guitar Hero. Blake was an East Coweta High School student interested in someday becoming a TV anchor or a lawyer. On October 15, 2011, his mother, Melissa Chapel, drove him to Coles to pick out a tie for a school dance. Afterward, Melissa drove him to his girlfriend Ryan's house on Avondale Circle in the parks of Olmstead subdivision. At about 5.30 p.m., Ryan's mom, Shannon, drove Blake and Ryan to a sushi restaurant for dinner and then afterward dropped them both off at the school's homecoming dance. Sometime around 10.30 p.m., Ryan's mother picked the couple up from the dance and brought them back to her home, where they watched a movie and hung out. At around 11.30 p.m., Shannon drove Blake to his friend Austin Harmon's house. Once there, Blake used the house phone to call his mom and clarify that he could stay the night. She agreed, but under the condition that they stay there and not leave. His phone, which he had gotten only a week before, only had a text messaging plan, although he could dial 911. He told his mother during a phone call that he had a great time dancing and spending time with his friends at the dance. She had no way of knowing that would be the last time she would ever talk to her son again. As teens do, Blake and Austin quickly decided to walk to the BP gas station at the entrance to Summer Grove. They were hoping to buy some cigarettes, even though they were both underage. But the store was closed and the two walked back. 
Austin said they got back to his house shortly after midnight. Ryan received a text message about 2 a.m. from Blake saying he was coming to her house, something they already planned ahead of time. When Austin found out about his plan, the two of them got into an argument. Blake then left Austin's house and walked the 3.2 miles back to Ryan's house. He arrived at her house sometime around 4.30 a.m., wearing black pants and a white hoodie. He sneaked in through her bedroom window, but was soon caught by Ryan's grandmother, who then went and told Shannon. At around 5 a.m., Blake started to walk back to Austin's house. As he was walking, he sent several text messages to Ryan's mother apologizing for the incident. Then minutes later, at about 5.30 a.m., Blake sent a text to Ryan explaining that he had been stopped by a police officer who had asked where he was going and had asked for his ID and mentioned he was near a bridge. Minutes later, the final text came through saying it was cold out and then Blake vanished. It would later be found out that the Georgia State Patrol, the Coweta County Sheriff's Office, and other agencies in the area had no record of the supposed stop and said it was standard procedure for all officers to call in when a stop is made. It's also standard procedure to ask for identification, but there were no records of anything relating to Blake. There are two main paths that Blake could have taken that night, one along Lower Fayetteville Road and the other along Summer Grove Parkway. Blake, however, was unfamiliar with the Summer Grove area, and the common consensus among police and friends is that Blake was walking along Lower Fayetteville Road, the easiest way for him to get back to Austin's house. Based on various walking speeds from Ryan's house, investigators believe Blake was in the vicinity of the creek that runs beneath those two parallel roads when he sent his last text. At night, the area along Lower Fayetteville is very dark, with heavy vegetation coming almost up the roadway. Shannon would later say she regretted not driving Blake back to Austin's house. Early on the morning Blake went missing, Shannon began questioning whether Blake made it to Austin's house and contacted Austin's mother, who tried to wake Austin up at 9 a.m. When Austin woke up at 9.30 a.m., he did not see Blake anywhere. Shannon and Ryan started driving around, looking for any signs of Blake. Shannon's husband, Matt, met up with Austin at 11 a.m. and started searching the nearby woods. At about 11 a.m., Austin flagged down a police car driving by and explained that his friend was missing. The officer called Blake's mom and told her that her son was missing and she should file a missing persons report. During the search, a BP gas station clerk was shown a picture of Blake. The clerk recognized Blake as a guy who bought tea and a pack of crackers at the store around 7.30 a.m. The clerk remembered Blake asking when the store opened. If the clerk is correct, Blake was still alive at 7.30 a.m., but officers stated that the kid resembled Blake instead. There had been other potential sightings by friends out searching for Blake, but police don't believe anyone actually saw him. Blake's mother said that when her son first went missing, she asked police repeatedly to triangulate his phone, but she has no idea if they ever did. Investigators said they pulled phone records, but not necessarily triangulation. The investigator also said it didn't appear that their agency had any contact with Blake that night, so who did? In the summer of 2011, Blake was living briefly in Clayton County at the Hunter Ridge Trailer Park in Jonesboro. He was dating another girl at the time, a 16-year-old named Skylar. In May 2011, she ran away from home after an argument with her mother, leaving her cell phone behind and went to find Blake. Her mother and stepfather Earl went out to look for her. Meanwhile, Blake was riding a bicycle, saw Skylar, and was giving her a ride to call her mother when her stepfather attacked him. A witness said Earl went up to some nearby people, raised his shirt to reveal a gun, and asked where Blake was. Numerous witnesses told officers that Earl grabbed his stepdaughter, put her in the trunk of his vehicle, and drove off. However, the then-girlfriend refuted this claim. Soon after, Blake was carried by friends to the nearest phone and called 911, and then was treated for cuts and a concussion. When police arrived at the scene, Blake told them that Earl and another man had hit him in the face, thrown him to the ground, and then kicked him twice in the face. 
It's unclear what happened after that, as Blake and the girlfriend did not continue seeing each other, but the cop that investigated the incident was a friend of Earl's. Instead of arresting the men for assaulting Blake, they allegedly turned it back on Blake and had him put in the Clayton County Jail for 17 days before he was released. According to court records, on July 1st, a warrant was issued by Clayton County Police against Blake for interfering with custody, a misdemeanor, because although he was 17 and Skylar was 16, he was viewed as an adult legally in this case, and she was viewed as a child and in his custody after she ran away. Blake was booked on June 2nd, spent 16 days in jail trying to raise bond, and was finally released on a $2,500 signature bond on June 18th. Pre-trial and related court matters occurred with a final court date set for October 24, 2011, over a week after Blake went missing. On that date, the prosecution decided to drop the case. The prosecutors spoke to the girlfriend, who confessed to running away and said Blake did nothing wrong and had actually encouraged her to go back home. His mother said she received a phone call from Blake's attorney to tell her that the stepfather told the judge he would drop the case provided he never saw Blake again. The homecoming dance was the first time he had gotten a hangout since he was released from jail. Melissa wanted to ensure he was safe, so they packed up and moved to Sonoy. She also refused to let him have any contact with his friends from that county, worried Earl might try and assault him again. Nearly two months after he went missing, on December 19, 2011, his mother got the call that her little boy had been found dead in a small creek that runs alongside the driving range at Summer Grove Golf Club near the bridge at Summer Grove Parkway. Strangely, when Blake was found, he was only wearing his underwear and had suffered a close-range gunshot wound. Investigators could never locate any other clothing articles, including Blake's hoodie, pants, or shoes that he was wearing when he left Ryan's house. They were also never able to find his cell phone, wallet, ID, or backpack. To this day, his mother, Melissa, has never been allowed to identify Blake's body. Noonan PD identified Blake by his piercings and tattoo. They even went as far as having a guard stand watch to ensure Melissa could never lift the sheet to see his body. She was only allowed to touch his foot or leg over the sheet. Since the beginning of the investigation, authorities have wrestled with one key question. How would anyone know where Blake was at that particular time? No one knew what path he would take and when he would be where he was. Police have pulled the messages of everyone who was in contact with Blake during the last hours of his life. They have not found anything that answers that question. They also determined the only texts Blake sent after 5 a.m. were to Ryan's phone. Since no one but Ryan's parents knew where he was that night, investigators are leaning toward the possibility that the killing was random. One theory is that Blake might have been the victim of a robbery, but that scenario does not wash with family and friends. Melissa, Shannon, and others are adamant that someone who knew Blake was involved. Ryan's stepfather was given a lie detector test and passed. His girlfriend and her family were all questioned by police, and none of them were named suspects. Some believe that his ex-girlfriend, Skylar, played a part in his death. Their theory is that she lured him out through a mutual friend because he would have tried to help her if she had led him to believe she needed help. Blake's only known enemy at the time was Earl, who said he never wanted to see Blake again. There are also allegations that Earl made threats about killing Blake. Authorities have never revealed the exact caliber gun used and said that Earl has been cleared as a suspect. However, as of January 2023, no one has ever been arrested or named a suspect and this case remains unsolved. <laughs>